What's up guys, this is Nock V. Got another uh, subscriber request. Cleany asks, can you do a video about mixing slash mastering? Something like showing out the whole process, what you do, and some tips. Whew, that's a big topic. Um, so first off, a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, I'm not the best at ma mastering and mixing, nor do I claim I know entirely what the hell I'm doing. But there's some things I've picked up along the way. Uh, things that I believe I understand. So one of the things that's useful to know is the difference between mixing and mastering. Um, mixing is essentially making sure each single element of the track doesn't clash with anything else and sounds as good as it possibly can, so that when everything is mixed together, it sounds as good as it possibly can. Mastering really is just about the loudness of the track in its entirety. Mastering has had different meanings in the past, like where it was the process of getting an album to sound perfect for being pushed to a mastering CD, to be recorded to a mastering CD that gets prepared for pressing discs for manufacturing. Um, same with uh, mastering for vinyl. There are certain things you had to do to make sure a, a vinyl or a recording was fine for vinyl too. This stuff doesn't really apply to modern day, whereas just mastering is literally just the process of getting things as loud as possible so that really you could just put the MP3 or put the WAV file out into the open and tell people to download it and listen to it. So a lot of people have different opinions on mastering and whether or not loudness is good or not. There is this whole loudness wars thing where people hate the idea of things being as loud as possibly can because when things become loud they lose their dynamic range and people don't like that whereas a lot of listeners and myself included i like things to be as loud as possible it sounds the best that way to me this is just personal opinion so what i'm going to be going over is different techniques that i've used for mixing um a few of those are going to be a lot of a lot based on side chaining side chaining plays a huge role in my music and I'm going to go through exactly what that is and how to use it to get the best possible sound. Then there is uh, equalizing and I'm going to talk about each different element of a track having its specific place in the track, in the mix. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about stereo image and uh, about compression. Those are sort of two minor things. Anyways, let's get to it. Okay, first off I'm going to cover mastering. I don't really think it'll take too long, so I might as well get this one out of the way first. Um, so mastering, as I've said before, is really just the, the act of getting everything to be loud. So mastering really just comes down to putting a few effects onto the master bus, which is this, this guy over here. Um, I've got two different things running at the moment. Um, I've got Patcher with a bunch of stuff chained together, and I've got Ozone 7. Um, I was messing around with Ozone 7. Uh, trying to get something that sounds as good as what I usually use, and uh, I don't really think I was able to get it. Um, so I've just been uh, staying with my usual master chain. And really all that consists of is some EQ and uh, image lines maximizer. Maximizer is just a multiband compressor. So really what that does is it acts as a limiter that limits on the lows, mids, and highs separately. Also uh, one over the top of everything as well. So I don't really know too much about making the mastering presets. So what I actually have is a preset that was taken from a seamless FLP file. You know, that dude who does all like the how to base tutorials and stuff like that, that guy. So not really too much interesting there. Um, my mastering EQ, some people might cringe while looking at this considering that it's a uh, brick wall, high pass and low pass. Um, I cut down everything below what, 27 Hertz and everything above like 15 K. Now, I'm led to believe that that uh, creates a little bit more headroom that sort of can be translated to loudness when it comes to the actual maximizing stage. Um, then I've got a little bit of a, just a limiter and a not, <laughs> this, this kind of joke of a loud, loudness. How long has that typo been there? This knob pretty much just uh, affects the gain on, on here just to create some... Um, some amplification before everything goes into the EQ and maximizing. So what this track sounds like uh, unmastered, we'll turn everything off and have a listen to it.
See, everything sounds a little bit weird and that's probably due to the fact that I produce with mastering effects turned on. So I'm used to it sounding uh, a little bit more like this. So really that's, that's all mastering comes down to is chucking some effects onto the master bus that make everything as loud as possible. Ideally, you shouldn't produce with these on. I do, but, uh, you know, do as I say, not as I do, because <laughs> I do it wrong. So in terms of mixing tips, there are a few things that I'm doing that I'd like to go over. Um, mostly being side chaining. Side chaining is a huge element in what I do. In essence, what side chaining is, is getting the audio signal of one element to affect the volume of another. And the way I use this is to get the kick drum to reduce the volume of say the leads or the vocals or the bass whenever they're playing. What I'll do is I'll show a part where that sort of actually makes sense. In fact, I'll probably just draw something in. So I'll take our melody and I'll put that out here. And we'll take my side chain, which I always put generally at the top. And we'll listen to that without the side chain for a bit and then listen to it with the side chain. Now, I'm not totally sure you could hear a difference there. Let's, let's listen to that again. So let's actually have a look at that visually and see what we can see. What we can see. So this is limiter. Limiter is what I use to handle sidechain compression. And this line at the top here represents the loudness or the volume of it, I guess. And you can see that when that side chain comes in, this volume is ducking out here. I could probably uh, accentuate that effect by um, turning the ratio up and the threshold down. Now I'm specifically affecting just one element of the, uh, the lead. So I'll turn the other one off and have a listen to it. Now, perhaps I should probably actually go over the reason why I do this. And it's for two reasons. I think, um, A, you're able to get the kick drum to be more pronounced. And B, you're able to increase the volume on your leads without having it uh, drown out the kick. So it kind of helps the lead be more pronounced and it also helps the kick be more pronounced. So we'll get the kick drum in and have a listen to how that sounds along with it. As opposed to Okay, so that is what side chaining is. Let's talk about how to actually do it. Okay, so now we have a clean slate with no side chaining at all. Okay. So to create my side chains, I use the sample of the kick. So what I'll do is I'll get the kick drum pattern. I'll control shift C that to duplicate it. And I'll also right click on the kick drum and clone it. Now I'll copy that pattern over to the next kick drum. So we have our other kick pattern, which is fine. Now we've created a new kick drum on a new pattern. And I usually shorten down the kick a little bit. And that's achieved by having this kind of effect in the envelope. This just, just hold only allows the kick sample to be like that not always completely full. 
with the tail and everything. Um, so these are on the same effect slots. And what I want to do is take this and put that over into our side chain. Um, obviously this would be blank and I would like call it side chain and everything like that. Do the whole F2 thing and, you know, name it. Um, Edison shouldn't even be here. That, that was an accident. So what we would have is this. And that's pretty much just the short kick drum. So we don't want to actually hear it. So we'll unroute it from the master channel. So the signal is still there, but it's not being played out. Now, limiter uses a weird kind of protocol for how it sees side chaining signals. So what we want to do is we want to route this to our lead. So obviously that's going to play out, but we don't want it to. So what we do is we turn the volume of the routing down. Now we'll open up a limiter and go to the compression section and change the side chain up to one. Now this little number correlates to the different things that are routed to it. So if we were to route this uh, vocal to it as well, you'll see we have two inputs to choose from. We'll just get rid of that. We don't want that. Now, since my side chain is always on the first effect slot, uh, it'll always be number one here, regardless of how many inputs there are into this uh, effect slot. Now, that alone has not done anything. What we need to do is tell the limiter exactly how much of that signal is going to affect the uh, side chaining. So to do that, you down this threshold. Now you can see that signal there, like it's there and it knows about it. What we need to do is also turn the ratio up. Now I'm not totally sure on the mathematics of, of how this works, but as far as I can tell, the threshold is sort of at what volume does the side chain need to be to actually start affecting it. The ratio is sort of how much it affects it by. So generally if I amp this ratio up, you'll see a lot more effect. And it's not affecting it too much because this threshold is only just getting the tip of this kick drum. So we can down the threshold as well. Now that's starting to sound like a side chain. One of the other things you can do is mess with this uh, release and also the attack, but I, I never really touched the attack. The release defines how much time it takes for the volume to sort of come back up. So if you turn this release up a lot, you can see what kind of effect that has as opposed to a very short release. I also do this side chaining effect on vocals as well to get the vocals to be able to be more volume while also having the kick drum to be more pronounced in the track. And you can see that in action here. Okay, so next topic, EQing. EQing could possibly be one of the most important aspects of production. In short, EQing means messing with the frequencies that a certain sound occupies. And what that means is defining how much bass or mids or treble a sound actually has. So why is that important? Every element of a track has its place in the mix. The bass obviously should take up the low end. Not entirely just low end, but the primary sound of the bass should be in the low end. The kick drum also occupies a fair bit of low end, but it also occupies frequencies almost all across the entire spectrum. 
things like lead synths probably shouldn't take up any bass while the bass is playing. But obviously, while it's not, they, they're free to do whatever the hell they want. Percussion, apart from the kick drum, they probably shouldn't take up too much of the bass. And I mean, really, that's... So that's really my philosophy on EQing, is that bass should take up the bass frequencies. Everything else should stay the hell out of it. So you'll see, when, I, when you look at the EQing settings on my leads, I get rid of a lot of the bass on them. When you look at the EQing setting on all of my percussion, I get rid of a lot of the bass on it. Um, my percussion is all routed to a single uh, effect slot. And I don't always do this, but it's probably a good idea for me to, so that way I can, if you just listen to just percussion. I mean, you can really hear that all it needs to take up is all this stuff up here. It doesn't need to take up any of the bass. The leads, sometimes, that's a bit of a tricky one because sometimes they really should use up some bass. The reason why I do that EQing on the leads is because the majority of the time when the lead is playing, the bass also is as well. And I don't want them to get uh, conflicted. I don't, want, I don't want them to clash. So when I turn the EQ off there, it, I mean, you didn't really hear much of a clash, but in the grand scheme of things, when everything is added together, it can cause some issues. And sometimes I do some stupid EQing, like this, this high end on the kick. I don't know. So now I'm going to talk about stereo imaging. And while this isn't necessarily a, a mixing tip, um, it's kind of one of those things I do so much because it sounds cool. And it brings more depth to some of the elements of what I work on. And I, one of the things I constantly use stereo effects on are my bass. What I used to do this is the Isotope Ozone Imager. So let's have a listen to how this bass sounds on its own. Without the stereo imaging effects on there, it sounds something like this. Uh, very thin and kind of unappealing. Whereas there, it sounds kind of wide, and I like that sound. And sometimes adding that wideness seems to add this kind of level of a... I don't really know how to explain it. It's kind of this crunchy buzzing effect. Okay, so let's have a look at how this works. Well, what I'll do is I'll, as per usual, I'll get rid of it and do it from scratch. So there's the bass as it sounds normally. Go up and add our uh, imager. And this is what it looks like. Uh, straight off the bat. Does nothing. What I do is turn on Stereo Eyes, which uses these to force things into being wide. By default, does nothing. So this is a multiband effect in that it affects the wideness of different portions of the frequency spectrum. So this one affects low end, this is mostly mids. These are kind of mid highs and highs. What I usually mess around with is mid highs and sometimes a little bit of the low mids. This is probably the most prominent sounding one to me. So I'll amp that one up and already you can hear the effect. You don't usually need to mess around with the highs too much and just a little bit of the mids as well. And we're back to where we started. In summary, just chuck this effect on, turn on stereo wise, and mess with these until you get the sound that you want. You generally shouldn't mess with the um, widening of like sub frequencies, but I don't know, do what you want to do. Honestly, I don't even hear the difference. And I, I was going to talk about compression, but honestly, I feel like there's not too much I can say about it, apart from the fact that it makes things louder and more punchier sometimes. And that's what I do on my kick drums. I mean, without compression, it pretty much sounds like this.
And I mentioned in a previous video that all I really do to my kicks is I chuck camel fat on them, uh, use this to clear the preset, um, turn on the compressor, chuck up the amount, turn on distortion, just add a little bit of tube distortion, not too much. I mean, that, that sounds exactly the same as what we had before, right? Yeah. I mean, this really kind of sums up all I really had to say on mixing. I kind of hope this was useful. I have the sneaking suspicion that it was useless. But anyway, um, I'm going to be releasing this track pretty soon. Uh, obviously, another Cell remix from me. Hey, when don't I do those? And uh, as always, if you have any requests, let me know in the comments. I'll probably get around to it. And I'll see you guys in the next video.